Chapter 6, Dietrichurin, the teacher. The colony children all called him Jake Vetter, and although Jake Mandel wasn't everyone's uncle, he was mine. At two o'clock on Sunday summer afternoons, when we saw him walking from his house to the church with a bag of licorice in one hand and the leather strap in the others, we grabbed our pillows and blankets and followed. From every corner of the community, we tumbled after him like goslings pursuing their mother. Stern and aloof, Jake Mandel was in charge of afternoon naps for school-aged children. Naps were designed to keep us out of trouble and to continue to provide structure to our summer days. While other cultures discouraged sleeping in church, ours, in its way, embraced it. Sandra and I would find a spot on the cool hardwood floor beneath the rows of pews and inhale the velvety scent of varnish that permeated the darkened church. The spicy smell and dignified atmosphere transported us to a sacred place. If we lay very still, we could almost hear the echo of our parents singing and the vibrations of Jake Vetter preaching the sermon in his captiv captivating monotone voice. Huddled together, nose to nose under our blankets, we were inseparable by day as if someone had tied us together. Sometimes our sleepy eyes surrendered freely, but generally I would whisper something foolish and Sandra would giggle. Jake Vetter, who patrolled the aisle in his soundless bedroom slippers, suppressed any noise or chatter with a whack from his fearless strap. His aim was singular and fierce, and when he wasn't sure which bump was the guilty one, he just guessed. As long as the end result was silence, he didn't care. More often than not, the strap landed on me. I found it terribly unfair that Sandra didn't declare her guilt and take her punishment, but she was just too happy to have gotten away with it. Unable to defend myself, I would turn over and sniffle her lump to sleep, two pairs of bare feet sticking out of one end of the blanket and two mutes and bonnets peeking out of the other. An hour later, flushed and rested, we would stir but didn't rise until a snoring Jake Vetter, his hands still clutching the strap, awoke on the front bench. Come us here, he would command, his hands wrestling with the bag of licorice. We would stream to the front and he would playfully hit us over the head with a long rope of red licorice before handing it to us. In the summer of 1965, Sandra's and my kindergarten days were over and our routines shifted significantly. We both turned six in July and without ceremony graduated from childhood to the status of young girls. We were now required to eat with the other children in the Essential and to attend Gaybet evening church services seven days a week. With the exception of our summer afternoon naps, church had been off limits. Daily attendance at first seemed overwhelming, but the sure knowledge that we would get the strap at the essential if we dared miss did wonders for our attendance record. On weekday evenings, church began at five o'clock just prior to supper. Mother would starch and iron her teakle while peering out the front window, and when people began spilling out of their homes and heading for church, she knew Jake Vetter had been spotted leaving his house clutching his sermons and songbooks. Reinhold Gebet, she would shout to father, scrubbing up in her small bathroom. Father seized his black hat with one hand and the front door with the other, and mother fell in line behind him, hastily facing, fastening her teakle under her chin. Anne-Marie, ledge de moots on, she reminded as the door closed behind her, and I quickly fastened my bonnet. My brothers, Edwin and Alex, and I knew enough to follow our parents out the door to the white stucco building with the grey roof across from Saint Basil's house. Mother was slender and fashion conscious and a woman deeply devoted to her children. She had promised herself on those awful nights so long ago when she ached with loneliness for her own mother that when she had children of her own, they would never feel like a burden. From morning to night, when it came to her family, her energy was boundless. From a young age, I was very attached to her. I clung to her skirt when we went to town and we were subjected to the often cold and suspicious glances of English people in stores. During those years, I had a recurring dream that Mother and I had accompanied the colony seamstress to a fabric store in Winnipeg. It was a large warehouse, and there were shelves and tables of fabric as far as the eye could see. A rack of buttons in every color imaginable down one aisle caught my eye, and after a time, I realized that Mother was gone, and I was alone in a store filled with English women. Panicked, I ran around trying to find her, but the tables were so laden with fabric I couldn't see her over them. I ducked down low, and in the distance I saw her unmistakable pleated skirt. The way she dressed was my shield, and when she spoke to me in our, ang in our language, her voice was my sanctuary. In church, we were seated according to age, with males and females on opposite sides of the aisle. The youngest sat in the first row so the minister, not our parents, could keep an eye on us. I squeezed into my spot next to Sandra, and we exchanged a quick smile, proud and nervous to officially be among the grown-ups. Weekday evenings, church was 
relatively brief, but on Sunday mornings, the lair, morning service, stretched from half an hour to 90 minutes. Sandra and I would pass the time by discreetly drawing on each other's arms with hairpins, all the while staring straight ahead, our eyes fixed on the preacher, who, with a fleeting look on our, our way, commanded our best behavior. The 350 sermons used by the Hutterite Church were composed nearly 500 years earlier and had been passed from generation to generation. They were as ancient as the method of singing in which the service began. The minister would chant a line of a song and the congregation would respond in a forceful, shrill manner. Annie Stahl, who considered herself gifted in the singing department, sang the loudest and her voice was so piercing she could make the dogs howl. But to hear her tell it, if God gave you a talent, by golly, you should make the use of it. Make good use of it. Sandra and I emulated the skilled sounds of our mothers coming from the middle rows behind us. For, for this sacred screech was applied only for solemn occasions such as church and funerals and would take some time to master. The elderly, like Ankela and Oma, had earned their place on the cushioned back rows with others of their vintage where the pressure to perform was not as great. Since joining the Hutterite colony, Oma had made no attempt to draw her hair, wear a polka dot tickle, or to speak the Corinthian dialect like everyone else. Instead, she combed her long white hair straight back under a solid black kerchief and adhered strictly to high German. Perhaps it was the persistent sadness in her pale oval face and eyes that never smiled that made Jake Mandel and other members of the community turn a blind eye to those things, for Oma had endured enough sorrow for several lifetimes. Two years after we moved to Fairholme, Opa had died a torturous death from lung cancer. My memories of him were vague, but the awful ordeal was etched in Oma's face. Once a heavy smoker, Opa was forced to kick the habit after joining the colony, but it was too late. As the disease destroyed his body and rendered him helpless, my mother's presence seemed to be the only thing that could soothe him. Oma couldn't bear to watch her husband's terrible demise. Ah, Gott, she cried every time he soiled the bedsheets. Looking after you is not trouble at all, my very pregnant mother, who exhausted herself looking after him, constantly assured him. Day and night, she faithfully changed his bedsheets and gently washed his feeble body. Opa was a man of few words, but when he spoke, what he said was memorable. His cool head and diplomatic skills fascinated colony people whose direct manner of speaking was primarily designed to promote humility. Others often tried to involve him in their skirmishes just to see what he would say. After two colony men passionately argued their opposing points of view in front of him, he calmly concluded, So viel Wahrheit geiz uven neigt, that meant that much truth doesn't exist. Such stick handling endeared him to the entire community, and in the days before he died, Opa requested to say goodbye to every colony member. One by one, they came to bid farewell to the gentlemen among them. On the afternoon that he died, tears streaming down his pain-racked face, he clasped Mother's hand in his and said to her, Goodbye, Maria. Gott wirns dir Bohem. God will repay you for what you've done for me.